Glory to you, O Lord. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John that you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who wear soft robes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. See, I am sending my messenger after you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those sort of women, no one has risen greater than John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The Gospel of the Lord. Have you ever put yourself out there, really taken a risk on behalf of someone or something, and then found yourself acting in a moment of trust? Where are those that you can make a mistake? A passion project or a relationship or a new job or a large purchase, whatever it is, went on a later called a little place. Well, in this reading, we just heard from the Gospel of Matthew. John the Baptist is having a moment like this. John was as committed as they come. One who described his commitment as zealous. He was living as an ascetic, separated from society, living a subsistent life out in the heart of the day and He'd been publicly critical of the religious authorities, telling them that they were in need of radical repentance. He'd been teaching people that they didn't need to go to the temple to find the wisdom of God's guidance. They could find it in wilderness places. He'd been baptizing people in a river, not in a building or an official place. He'd been calling them to change their lives and commit to following God's way. Perhaps most central to God's message was the proclamation that God's kingdom had arrived. And it was ready to upend the worldly kingdoms that were already in place. The powerful would be brought low and the lowly would be lifted up. And God would anoint the chosen Messiah to be the ultimate king. John thought he knew who that chosen Messiah was, and he had staked everything his reputation, his ministry, even his life on that Messiah. A rather unlikely candidate. Jesus, from the tiny Galilean town of Nazareth, son of a carpenter. And all of John's behavior and outspokenness has not made him popular with common people who came out to the wilderness to hear John's preaching and to be baptized by him, but it made him rather unpopular with those in power, people of whom he was so critical. No king likes to hear that another king is on the way, ready to throne him and take his place. So the king of Judea, Herod, has had thrown John's throne in prison. And it's then that John has a moment of doubt. What if this guy, Jesus, isn't it? What if he's just a carpenter's son from a backyard town? What if he isn't the Messiah we've been waiting for or we've saved it all from the wrong John didn't have to see much of Jesus for himself. Sometime earlier, he baptized Jesus with great hope for what he might do in the world. Since he'd been thrown in prison, he's heard rumors of Jesus and heard snitted of Jesus' teachings. At this time, Jesus' ministry is done. His victory over the faith hardly a possibility that anyone in his death can imagine. Perhaps John. Had been waiting for a different kind of Messiah thing, 
maybe someone with more education or more training or more military experience or more political influence. So kind of king reasons are the made after all. Regardless, whatever John is wondering about, some of his message sends the healer through his disciple. Even our the one was the creator. So in response to John's question, it is only in the teaching or the theological discourse. In response to the word, it the equivalent of just watch. Watch what I do. Watch how I heal people, free people, change people. My interaction with the embodiment of God's love and mercy will speak for themselves. So John's decided to go back to the and they tell him. What they have seen. They tell him that they have witnessed things that are bringing healing and liberation for all people, especially people who struggle the most the sick, the disabled, the wounded. The way Jesus describes the ministry, when he said, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, those words carry another message. They reveal just the kind of thing that Jesus will be. They echo ancient words from the prophet Isaiah. We heard those words this morning. Isaiah's vision paints a picture of the new life that will be possible through the Messiah. It is a transformation so complete that it's like a bright day that is turning into a lot of places. Plants and grow. Animals to thrive. The very landscape itself becomes an expression of joy. People who are weak in body find strength. Those who suffer in spirit find healing. There are no barriers to keep people from perishing. And this notoriously dangerous wilderness is now being safe for everyone. Anyone can find their way through. No one gets lost. No one gets hurt. That's how Isaiah imagines the miraculous restoration that God brings in the Messiah. It is total social and ecological beauty. It may be a little bit difficult for you here this morning in the land of 10,000 lakes, 10,000 frozen lakes, to grasp just how the people's vision of a moving desert would have summoned to its listeners. While you may not know what the blooming desert is like, you do know what the sacrifice is like to hear a vision of peace and harmony for the world and think, no way, that's impossible. A community in which no one is afraid and everyone is safe, that's impossible. A time when suffering minds and bodies are healed, that seems impossible. A place where all people are relatively seem to be comfortable. A landscape in which all species of plants and animals can thrive is impossible. When we look around the we see the metaphorical approach. We see devastating violence and warfare, millions of people who lack access to institutions in terms of racism and prejudice. How does that loss and climate change decimate biodiversity? God in Christ really transformed all this. If you have asked this question, then know that you are not to the Long ago, someone has been saying the question from the public. Are you the one who will say this or not with Jesus? Because right now, it's me who sees. If this is your prayer, then why don't you pray it alongside John? That courageous prophet who gave everything he had for the sake of the gospel, even though he couldn't see the end of it. In the midst of his uncertainty, in the midst of his fear, he believed that God could still, somehow, bring restoration to the earth. He held on to the vision of the desert, even though he had not yet experienced it. And you can hold on to that vision too. That vision was given to you for such a time as this. A time when you trust God, but you're still not sure how things will work out. 
and how do we have committed to the work of the gospel, which were overwhelmed by all the hurt in the world? A time when you look back on a life of faithfulness and still experience millions of doubt. John's example shows that faithful commitment to Christ does not mean a lack of faith. It means you trust God in the midst of your fear. You rely on God's voice even before you have seen our beautiful beings. You will offer your life in service to the gospel, just like John did. Even if you don't have all the answers, you keep your voice to us. Because your skill, your voice, and your witness are needed. You are a part of the restoration that happened in the heart. That you have a trust that the Holy Spirit will be able to give you to the words and the feet of Christ. And when you're afraid and change seems impossible, you can come back to this good news. You are putting your trust in a God who makes the impossible possible. A God who makes a way where there is no way, like you are in the desert. A God who brings good news to the poor. A God who comforts the suffering. A God who lifts up the lowly, who provides for the hungry, who brings the dead to life. You are trusting a God who keeps promises, even when they're beyond your life. God can see the end of the journey, even when you can't. But God goes with you every step of the way, even through the desert. Thanks be to God. Amen.